Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. It feels like it's been an eternity <laughs> since we've done a broadcast. We've been sharing with you for the last two weeks messages from the Prevail Conference and the Rivers of God series. And today we are studying 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now we're not coming to you live because as of the day this broadcast goes out, we will have returned from the Iberian coast and recovering from the time differentiation. <laughs> and we thought uh, we, we don't want to wait another day before doing a chapter, but we better pre-record it. Otherwise, we might not make sense. And it was a wonderful trip. We'll see. Very that. productive ministry a blessing trip. Time. And, uh, and enjoyed our anniversary but, away. And we did have our share, have our eighth anniversary while we Yay. were gone. And we've certainly missed all of you. Amen. We consider you our friends, those of you that may be new to the broadcast. Uh, we don't uh, do this Bible study in a studio, but we do it in our home environment. Originally started years ago, over six years ago, is just our personal Bible study, and we decided we wanted to include you in it. Mm -hmm. So today we are studying, continuing our study of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, a really great Bible study you're going to want to share with your friends that, that have a desire and hunger to see more of the gifts of the Spirit operating in their lives and in their churches. The diverse and lively church that God intends is revealed and expounded upon in 1 Corinthians 12. We see a church that is gifted, it's active, it's dynamic in its functioning with the foundational influence. This lively church, it's like, how many times do we hear that? I just want to find a lively church moving in the gifts. Well, if you're going to do that, you're going to have to find one that is perched upon. You can look at this chapter and its verses stacked up and perched upon. Verse 28 that says, First apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. After that, miracles. After that, healings. After that, we say, where's all the miracles? I can tell you exactly where it, the miracles are. The miracles are anywhere you can find that his first apostles, secondarily prophets. Oh, no, we don't want the apostles and the prophets. We just want the miracles. Sorry, it doesn't work like that. You, we study about this. Oh, I believe in the nine gifts of the Spirit. Well, if you believe in the nine gifts of the Spirit, you believe what they are perched upon, which verse 28 reveals us. To us is apostles, prophets, teachers. Then after that, having miracles is no mystery. We're not waiting on some obscure trigger in the glory by which God's going to begin to do. Mir no, miracles will be done. Miracles will be made manifest where it's first apostles, verse 28, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. So it's a powerful chapter. We tend to make obscure what we're not willing to flow with. And we see there's so much teaching today. What? Where's the move of God? I, I can tell you exactly where it is. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. That's where it is. <laughs> and when we align ourselves with what this says, not just taking it piecemeal. Well, I like verses 8 through 12, but I don't know about that 28 stuff. You know, we, we have a pastor, we have an evangelist, but them apostles and prophets, they're kind of problematic. Well, then we exclude ourselves from what God wants to give us. And uh, so we'll begin by reading verses 1 through 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant you know that you were Gentiles carried away into these dumb idols, even as you were led. That's just, uh, that's <laughs> about as diplomatic as Paul gets. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, I would not have you ignorant. What was he saying about the Corinthians? Go ahead. Verse 3, Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. There are Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. 
But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit withal. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these work that one and self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we are, were all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. So in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, Paul introduces the subject of spiritual gifts. In verse 1, the wording here is important to take into account because our idea of gifts is something wrapped up in a neat little package, and that isn't exactly how the gifts of God work. Uh, well, let everything be done decently and in order. And actually, that isn't what that verse says. How many times have you heard that quoted? Oh, let everything be done. No, it says, let all things be done decently in order in chapter 14 of First Corinthians. Mm -hmm. And so it's a big, big difference. If we're letting everything be done decently in order, that means everything that we're doing is going to be decently in order, but we're not necessarily doing everything that can be done. Mm -hmm. When we say let all things be done decently in order, that means if we're not letting all things take place, then we're indecent and disorderly. Because there's a lot of quenching of the gifts of the Spirit that takes place. And, no, we want to be decent and in order. And we're so committed to our idea of decency and order that we exclude the prophetic. We exclude moving in the gifts of the Spirit. We exclude body ministry in the name of, well, you know, I believe in the gifts, but we need to maintain order. Oh, really? Well, if you're maintaining order to such a degree that you're excluding the all things of First Corinthians 14, then you're, you, you're so orderly and you're so decent that you're indecent and out of order. <laughs> and why are we supporting that, uh, that philosophy of ministry? Why are we connecting with that? Because they serve a nice cup of coffee out in the foyer? Come on now. The gifts of the Spirit, they are, uh, don't come in neat little packages. The gifts of God are various in their administration, diverse in their manifestation, and flowing one into another in this effortless demonstration of the Father's mind, the Father's love, the Father's power. And in verse 1, I want you to notice, if you, if you have your Bible or you can open your Bible program, I want you to see that the word gifts, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant, the word gifts is actually not in the original text, but it was added in by the translators at a later time, who in their day, they saw the gifts more as ecclesiastical endowments. And their, their thinking, if you had a gift, then... The Church of England was going to put a bishop's mitre upon your head. To their thinking, those that were involved in translating the Bible as has come to us from the Alexandrian text that originated in uh, the uh, those who brought forth the King James Bible, that was their thinking. But if you leave out the word gifts, which is not in the original text, you would more properly understand the word spiritual here as being in the plural, which meaning in other versions they, they would say concerning spirituals, mm -hmm. plural. Mm -hmm. And it comes from the word the spirituals, and actually the word spiritual and the word carnal, as far as what I have studied, were coined, terms that were coined by the Apostle Paul, just like Jesus, from what I have studied, termed the usage coined the usage of the word hypocrite as to uh, point out a religious pretender. The word hypocrite existed before Jesus, but it was saying, we would say, an actor. It's an actor on stage. Mm -hmm. Jesus coined the term as applying to religious pretenders. Paul, from what I can see, invented the word spiritual and the word carnal as we would 
apply them. And in this case, he's using it in the plural, and it comes from the word pneuma, when we say Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, or see the word spirit in the New Testament, it originates in the, from the word pneuma, which means a current of air. And it can also be translated, and I, I like this, as etherals, mm -hmm. something that is etheral, and we'll define that a little bit more. So we could translate for or transliterate verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 12 saying, Now concerning etherals, brethren or spirituals, I would not have you ignorant. Now, what does the word etheral mean? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> the dictionary defines etheral, now listen, as immaterial. Now think about the definition of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The, the whole point of faith is about manifesting the substance, bringing the immaterial into the material. Etheral also means intangible, bringing the intangible into the tangible. A healing that begins as a gift, it's etheral, it's immaterial, it's intangible. When the gift is operated, it comes out of the intangible and the immaterial into substance and somebody gets healed. Are you listening? Mm -hmm. It also means delicate or refined. I like that. That implies something very nuanced. The gifts of God don't operate like a sledgehammer. <laughs> uh, oh, I just couldn't help it. I just had to disrupt this service. No, the gifts of God are delicate. They're refined. And if you're acting in an indelicate, disruptive, or unrefined way, I question the quality, the purity of the gift that you're operating in. Now, what this communicates for us is that the gifts of the Spirit are very nuanced in manifestation, whereby God br is bringing his knowledge and his power through the gifts, through the spirituals, through the etherals. He brings his knowledge and his power online in our lives and in our meetings as the tangible from the intangible. The immaterial presence of God brought into material form in demonstrations of his heart and demonstrations of his hand working in our midst for our good and his glory. That's a working definition of what a gift of the Spirit is, and it's what we used to call body ministry. Those of you that weren't around for the charismatic movement in its height won't remember this, but back in the days when the charismatic movement was 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 very strong back in the 60s and the 70s. There we had the worship leader who brought us into worship, and we really liked that. There was the speaker, the pastor, the teacher who would teach and minister, and we really liked that. But there was a third something called body ministry. Mm -hmm. It's when the Holy Spirit hovered like God moved or he brooded over the chaos and said, light be, there was the brooding of the Holy Spirit over the body mm -hmm. and the body spake. People don't trust the body these days. We don't make room for body ministry because leaders that are in charge don't trust the body. To they And the bottom line is they don't trust the Holy Spirit. But mm -hmm. let me tell you something. It was the part of the meetings in those days that brought the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. The miracles did not happen during worship, although worship was awesome. The miracles didn't happen during the preaching and teaching, although the preaching and teaching was anointed and awesome. The miracles took place when God stepped in and he manifested himself in, among the members of the body and things began to happen and the Holy Ghost showed up and people's lives were forever changed through the liberal open and free exchange of the ethereals of God as God made himself known. And we've ruled that out in church as we know it today, and we're not better off for it. Mm -hmm. You remember those oh, days. I do. I was in the big middle of it. <laughs> and you say, well, we're in a larger church. We can't do that. That's not true. There was a church called Grace Chapel in Tucson, Arizona. It had over 2,000 members. And you would see the Holy Spirit come in in body ministry and would sweep from one end of that congregation to the other in a mighty wave. As in, They didn't take it to an afterglow room. They didn't say, let's get somebody's permission first. They found a way, because they so respected the moving of the Holy Spirit, they found a way to let God be God, even in the midst 
of 2,000 people that came to worship God, one of the most powerful churches I was ever a part of as a young man in my teens. Now, at the beginning of 1 Corinthians, Paul greets the Corinthian church. Now, he said in 1 Corinthians 1, 7, he said, you come behind in no gift. So think about that. When he was first writing to them at the beginning of this book, he says, oh, you Corinthians, I'm so happy to write you because I know you come behind in no gift. Fast forward to chapter 12. He says, but you don't come behind in any gift, but you got a little bit of ignorance where the gifts are concerned. Let me help you. See, they're in a state of ignorance regarding the gifts. Do you ever see somebody move in a gift that demonstrated in addition to moving in the gift that they were ignorant? I have. <laughs> See, they, they came behind in no gift, but nonetheless, Paul could see that they were in a state of ignorance regarding the gifts that were clearly proliferating in their midst. And because, because Paul sees them as ignorant, he tactfully proposes to instruct them. What do you mean I'm ignorant? I can prophesy. What do you mean I'm ignorant? I laid hands on somebody that came out of a wheelchair. What do you mean? We make those people the authorities. Just because somebody can move in a gift does not mean they're informed and does not mean they're mature, as Paul's demonstrating. See, Paul wants to instruct them not for the purpose. I see a lot of instruction on the gifts that will quench the gifts in a church. Mm -hmm. I see this time and time again. God's moving, good things are happening, and then somebody wants to get up and teach on the gifts, and by, by the time they're done, they've quenched the very moving of the gifts that they claim to be teaching everybody about. What Paul was doing is he was not wanting to quench the gifts, but to encourage their operation in an orderly and necessary way. So what was it about the Corinthians and how they interacted with the gifts whereby Paul was caused to conclude they were ignorant? Well, in verse 2, he suggests to them that they're attempting to relate the gifts or the manifestations of God in the same way they had the spiritual activities of their pagan background. In other words, oh, we're ignorant, are we? Well, why do you think we're ignorant? Because you're treating the gifts the way you the pagans treat spiritual things as well. And so make no mistake about it. The Corinthians were very spiritual even before they came to Christ. Do you understand that being spiritual and being godly are two different things? Mm -hmm. There's a difference between that which is spiritual. Just because somebody can give you a goosebump doesn't mean it's God. Just because somebody can move in a word of knowledge doesn't mean it's God. There's a difference between that which is spiritual and that which is godly. Not everything spiritual is godly, and not everything godly is ethereal or esoteric in nature. If you, if you don't understand this, you're going to be easily led astray. And you would think in 2,000 years, Christians would learn something, but even those who claim to believe in the gifts of God and the prophetic approach these things in a very superstitious way. Their, the attitude toward spirituals, toward the gifts of the Spirit today, is positively, genuinely medieval. And many times in such a way that either allows excesses that do harm to people, or shutting down and quenching the Spirit, which harms them. Ex quenching the gifts of the Spirit and not allowing the gifts of the Spirit to move damages a people to the same degree that excesses uh, in moving of the gifts, when that is present, can damage a people. Now, there's another thing you need to know. Spiritual gifts, specifically prophecy, they are not like psychic readings. Spiritual gifts are not intended, listen to me, spiritual gifts are not intended to dispense with the need for faith believing. Amen. God gave the gifts to build faith, not dispense with faith. What am I talking about? Too many times people want a word that tells secrets not known to the person giving the word. And matter of fact, they will put down a prophetic word by saying, well, you're just speaking according to knowledge. You know why people do that? Because they don't want a word from God. They want a psychic reading. And somebody will come along and give them a psychic reading and tell them what their social security number is or tell them something they couldn't have possibly known. First Corinthians 14 says that the word of knowledge 
in the church was not for the believer, but for the unbeliever. The word of knowledge was for the unbeliever. And if you must have a word of knowledge before you will receive a prophetic word that is given, or if you reject a prophetic word, if it speaks according to something that the person sharing with you already knew in the natural, then you have confused, my friend, true prophetic utterance with a psychic reading or a clairvoyant reading, and you just, why don't you just go out and find you somebody with a crystal ball and let them speak over you because that's what you've denigrated the gift of God down to. Too many times people want these things. Listen, it doesn't take any faith to believe in a word that tells you secrets. The word of knowledge is for the unbeliever and not the believer, and so we need to grow up in this area. And this is ignorance on the scale of which Paul's trying to address in this chapter. Mm -hmm. Now he goes on to state in verse 3 that no man speaking by the Spirit of God will call Jesus accursed, and no man calling Jesus Lord will do so by any other agency than the Holy Ghost. I want you to see the broad parameters by which he's setting the boundaries or the buffers for that which is genuine and that which is not genuine. In other words, yeah, that that word, he's saying Jesus is Lord, but he's not prophesying like sister so-and-so, and and she's been prophesying in this church for 20 years. And if that person, I don't care if he's glorifying God, if he's prophesying or moving in a gift different from the way we're comfortable with it being done, well, that's not God. Well, ask yourself the question, is it calling Jesus accursed? I've had people... I was in the church one time, and a prof- I was the pastor. A prophetic word was given, and there was a family that had big problems with it, and they uh, called me back into the pastor's office, and they were having all these troubles with that prophetic word. I said, hold on. Here's what the word said. And there was nothing unscriptural about that word, and there was nothing untoward about that word. How come you think it's not a word from God? Well, we just know that it's not, really. Mm-hmm. Well, let me ask you something. There's about 16 people in my office. I said, "Have how many here have ever given a prophetic word? And not, there was not one person in that group of 16 people, several deacons included, that had ever given. I thought deacons were supposed to be full of the Holy Ghost. Yeah, I'm full of the Holy Ghost. I just don't move in the Holy Ghost. Mm-hmm. And I, So you've never given a prophetic word, but you know whether somebody else is given a word, whether it's God or not, it's not contrary to Scripture. It's not wrong or immoral in what it's saying. Who do you think you are? You don't know when God's talking to you, but you claim to know whether God's talking to somebody else or not, and you're mad at me because I'm not shutting that person down. So uh, he says... Uh, No man speaking by the Spirit of God will call Jesus accursed, and no man calling Jesus Lord will do so by any other agency than the Holy Ghost. So what does that mean? People were moving in spiritual manifestations among the Corinthians who were being marginalized uh, because they weren't prophesying in a familiar way. Do you ever have somebody move in the gifts of the Spirit in an un- familiar way, and people get kind of rankled. I don't know if that's God or not. Well, they're not calling Christ accursed. And apparently there were some people in this Corinthian church that were calling Christ accursed. So they were getting way out there. Listen, I don't care how pious or how deep or spiritual the person prophesying might be if they are not elevating God, if they're not speaking and glorifying Christ, then we need to stop and think. And how do you, somebody's shaking their head. I don't understand. Okay, let me help you with it. You need to watch the guy or the gal who gets up to prophesy and say, yay, little children, look unto me. Ah, me, me, me. (laughs) So you need to pay attention when they start talking like that. Have I not said Mm. wrong spirit, wrong attitude, wrong thinking? Or maybe I've been in charismatic Catholic meetings where it's not the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus, but it's not Jesus talking, it's Mary talking. Yea, my children, come unto your mother. I had a Pentecostal assistant pastor who'd jump up and say, come unto Jesus. And we were having dueling prophecies like dueling banjos in the charismatic Catholic meeting. (laughs) You've been around the horn, you know, been around the cup long enough to find the handle. You experience some things. 
Yeah. <laughs> and as a pastor, when you got, you know, we like green pastures, still, still waters. Works. Man, it's like, I would just soon exclude the whole thing. No, you don't have permission to do that, pastor. Mm-hmm. Uh, I get it. Rules are made by pastors that want to get to bed early. But if you still have a responsibility to train your people in things, that will tend to make your job a little harder at times because you have a lively, active, dynamic, gift-moving congregation on your hands that's going to make some mistakes, and you need to be there to correct and to help with that. So they must have had some definite ideas about how the gifts were to operate, because then Paul starts emphasizing the gifts are a diverse thing. There's differences of administration. They probably thought that the gifts had to come just one way. No, he's, Paul's saying, no, there's many ways to move in the gifts. There's differences of operation, differences of administration. But he said, it's all, relax, pastor, mm-hmm. it's all the same Holy Ghost. Yeah. <laughs> it's true today. People who think they know all about the gifts of the Spirit are more quick to denounce anything they aren't familiar with. And what's what am I talking about? Growing up in Pentecost, here's how it works. The pastor's wife gives the message in tongues, and the pastor gives the interpretation, and if anybody else does it, they're out of order. You, you may laugh, but I'm telling you, that's the unwritten rule in those groups that identify themselves as Pentecost. That's how it has to be. And if it's not that way, then it can't be God. And Paul is saying, look, we need to relax and let go of this stranglehold we have mm-hmm. on not wanting the unfamiliar and let the gifts of the Spirit move in our midst. Mm-hmm. And if you're not somewhere where people have that relaxed approach, then you need to start rethinking some things. Another problem Paul deals with among them, the Corinthians, is the idea that only certain people can move in the gifts. This fosters elitism in our ranks, and that's not godly. In verse 17, uh, Paul makes a statement. He says, the gifts of the Spirit are given to every man, and that word is anthropos. It includes women as well. The gifts of the Spirit are given to everybody, not just the pastor and the pastor's wife, not just the guy who thinks he's got his Holy Ghost six gun stalking the aisles to see who he's going to rebuke today because he thinks he's a prophet. The gifts of the Spirit are given to every man, and that includes you. Now listen, if you're not moving in the gifts, that might be average for your congregation, but it's not normal. That is not Holy Ghost normalcy as God intends. There's something wrong in the life of a believer who does not move in the gifts of the Spirit and is content for things to be that way. Do you move in the gifts? No, but I wish I could. Oh, you're in good company. Do you move in the gifts? No. Do you want to? Not really. That's not normal. There's something wrong there. It's likewise, it's wrong for somebody to move in a particular gift as though it is their personal domain. And anyone in the group who does like this, they're, they're out of order. That's elitism. It should be rejected as immaturity and falsehood. And then in verses 8 through 10, Paul gives the, the list of the nine gifts of the Spirit. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith. Gifts of healing, so we have more than nine gifts. Gifts of healing, working of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. Now these are the various gifts, and when you take into account that the healing gift is listed as gifts of healing, we really can't limit it to nine, because there may be dozens of gifts of healing as experienced by somebody being successful in seeing one thing healed but not other things healed. But then there will be somebody else who can get that thing healed in that person, this particular malady. I've seen that many times. People mm-hmm. that could get uh, – I've been very successful in seeing women uh, who have cancers of their feminine organs. I've seen those healed many, many, many times. Skin conditions – It just seems like I've always had a a gift to lay hands on people for skin conditions and see them get healed. But there's other things uh, I might lay hands and not see, not because I don't have faith. There are gifts, and God doesn't give everything to everybody at the same time. So we need to be flexible and teachable. 
in these areas and let the Holy Spirit flow in our midst with the primary expectation, not that everybody does everything the same way, but that everyone's eligible and that Jesus is glorified. His lordship is emphasized and the glory of God is made manifest in our midst. Verse 14 through the end of the chapter, okay. please. For the body is not one member, but many. 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 And if the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would were the smelling? But now God hath set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? Now, But now are they many members, yet but one body? And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head say to, to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. For those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our com uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need. But God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member be honored, all members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. So having expounded the variety of the gifts in the church, Paul enters into this, this emphasis of the people of God as the body of Christ. Now, there, I want to ask you a question. Are you in the body of Christ just because you're born again? You have to look at this in its context. Paul is identifying the body of Christ not by its spiritual state, but by its activity, specifically its dynamic involvement in the gifts of God. Mm -hmm. According to Paul, and in the context of his teaching, the body of Christ is made up of functioning members. And are you a functioning member just because you sit in the pew? Functioning members who are allowing the manifestation of the gifts in their lives. And I get it. Body ministry is pretty much non-existent in today's church. But Paul's discussion of the body of Christ is in the context of a dynamic body moving in the gifts, every man seeing the manifest. Look, if you want to see what the early church looked like, read 1 Corinthians 14. You don't see pulpit ministry in 1 Corinthians 14. You don't even see leadership in 1 Corinthians 14. Go read it. I challenge you to find pulpit ministry or church as performance in 1 Corinthians 14, which is the most detailed snapshot of how the early church did church that we know of. Body ministry was at, and of course, the cessationist people, yeah, but Paul was saying you don't need to do that. He was not saying that mm -hmm. because he repeated over and over again, every man can do this, let all things be done, you may all prophesy one by one. People try to twist his what he's saying as though you're not supposed to be doing any of that, and that's an absolute mm -hmm. lie. Paul's teaching about the body is predicated on the observation of a people moving in the gifts of God or in the ferals. That implies that believers who may be born again, but resistant to or lethargic or unbelieving in the area of participation in the gifts, well, then they are non-functioning members of the body. Now, they're born again, so they're alive, but they're not functioning. Mm -hmm. Hmm. What does that make them? There's no such thing as a member of the body that does not have a function. 
I'm alive. Don't you tell me I'm not going to heaven. Oh, no, you are spiritually alive. But you're not functioning. What is that? Tissue in a body that does not function falls under the heading of being a benign mass. Mm. Oh, I wouldn't hurt these people for nothing. I get it. You're benign. Just because you wouldn't hurt them, but you're not doing anything else? What does that make you? How can you be a member? Did Jesus create, is there, is there a gift? What's your place in the body of Christ? I'm a benign mass. Mm. Is that what God, did he just save you to sit in the pew, give an offering, support the pastor? Is that why he put you in the church? It's supposed to be lively stones. Living yeah. stones. Lively so <laughs> Serving a function. What's your function in the body of Christ? And your eyes go blank. Because you never allowed God to use you. You're a benign mass in the body of Christ. Or worse. And we need to change our thinking about this. To be anything other than a contributing, functioning member of the body is not conducive to your spiritual health. I know it's strong. But we're so much the other way. We need some strong language. To be anything other than a functioning member of the body is not conducive to your spiritual health. And it's not conducive to the health of the body of Christ in general. And I honestly, I'm not saying you're not saved, but I question whether you're actually a part of the body. Because the way Paul puts it, those that are a part of the body are functioning members of the body. Paul was dealing with people, every one of them were functioning. Their problem was not that they weren't functioning. Are you listening to me? Mm -hmm. Listen, you are not allowed. You are not allowed to be passive or not involved. You must find out, the Bible says plainly in Ephesians, make your calling and election sure. What's your calling? You know, mm -hmm. Somebody said, my calling is to be a loose cannon on the deck. No, you're not. Mm -hmm. My calling is to be the chief heckler. No, you're not. You have a function. You have a calling. And you need to find that out, and you need to live it out and carry it out uh, in a body by connecting yourself to something beyond yourself to remain aloof, isolated or standoffish from a spiritual family might be acceptable to you, but it's not acceptable. As Paul says in verse 15, we cannot say we don't need one another. How many of you have checked out of organized church and said, I don't need that? Well, you're disagreeing with what Paul said. Don't you be telling me I have to go. I know I don't have to go to church. God. I don't have to go to church to serve God. Well, your argument is not with me, your argument is with the Apostle Paul. And so if we're going to believe what the Apostle Paul said, does that mean you have to go into a brick-and-mortar church? Listen, we get more fellowship online in a digital footprint of ministry than we ever got in a brick-and-mortar church. We're getting it. <laughs> but you got to get something. You need to be a part of a family. You may choose not to connect substantively to the family of God, you may feel like you've been given a pass because you've been church hurt. But how do you reconcile that thinking with Paul's injunction to every one of us to be a functioning member of the body of Christ? Does 1 Corinthians 12 apply to others but not to you? On what basis do you exempt yourself scripturally from assembling yourself together with a body of believers? And are you correctable or uncorrectable in this area? Paul says we need one another. Because of our need, one for another, Paul says, and here's something else, there should be no schism in the body. Now, that's very challenging because Christianity as it exists today is known by its divisions. It's known by its schisms. Schism is the very heart and soul of Christian culture. Christian culture would not exist without our schisms that Paul denounces in 1 Corinthians 12. We identify ourselves as much by what we do not believe as what we do believe. This not only has created groups that fellowship in opposition to other groups who think differently, but now schismatic thinking is so pervasive that even individual believers refuse to identify with any group or spiritual family, feeling confident and at peace with being a schism of one. Mm -hmm. Isaiah said, the whole head is faint, the whole heart is sick. You and I must decide 
in this sin-sick cultural dynamic that we call Christianity, are we going to be a part of the problem or a part of the solution? Yeah, they're suffering. You don't know what I've suffered. I get it. Paul ta- immediately goes into conversation of that. We suffer with those that suffer. We weep with those that weep. Let us suffer, even if it isn't convenient for us. If we're suffering, he says, rejoice with those that we rejoice. Others are rejoicing. Let's not withdraw and lick our wounds, but realize that it isn't about us and make a decision to rejoice with those that rejoice, even if we selfishly aren't really into it as they are. Are you listening to me? And then in verse 28, we see the foundation laid under all of this activity of a gifted dynamic body. First apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. Mainline denomination I come out of, when you ask them about apostles and prophets, they say, do you believe in apostles and prophets? They say, we believe in licensed and ordained ministers. (laughs) Isn't that a smart aleck answer? And they sit back and pat themselves on the shoulder of how, how clever they were to avoid that question. One day, whoever penned that work, that statement is going to answer to God for what they did with 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. You better be finding out if the foundation under your feet is that kind of sickening thinking, or is it what the scripture says here in 1 Corinthians 12, 28. What if your church, it's interesting that pastors, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, and it's interesting that pastors and evangelists are not even mentioned. Mm -hmm. Could you have a church without a pastor? Could you have a church without an evangelist? Oh, we have to have, I love my pastor. We love our pastor too. But here, Paul is saying first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, and he doesn't even mention pastors and evangelists. What if your church doesn't have apostles and prophets? If not, why not? And why are you attending there? You want to see miracles? Oh, yeah, I want to see miracles. You better go find a church that believes first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. Oh, we believe in the apostles 2,000 years ago. Well, how convenient for you. (laughs) A dead apostle. We believe in the prophets from long ago. Yeah, they're dead. I get it. Somebody said the other day, Uh, Such and so is my prophet, and that prophet's dead. A dead prophet cannot be your prophet. A dead apostle cannot be your apostle. Who's the apostle in your church? Who's the prophet in your church? You know who your pastor is. You should know. And if you don't know, it's because you don't have one, and you can forget the things that come after. First apostle, second apostle, thirdly teachers, after that miracles. You can forget miracles. In your church, until you have a face and a name to who is the apostle, who is the prophet, just like you know who the pastor is in your church. And all that strong, Brother Walton, it really isn't. It's what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 12, 28. (laughs) If you don't like it, your argument's not with me. Your argument is with the apostle Paul. I challenge you to read this chapter and say and tell me that is not what this is talking about. So if your church doesn't have apostles and prophets, you you need to have a good reason for being there in that church. Well, it's my family church. It's not good enough. You better have a better reason than that. Is your church so spiritual that they do not need what God has given? Then they have rejected the foundation that God has set under them. First apostles. Prophet, if we didn't have a pastor come to church, oh, man, we got a problem. We don't have a pastor this Sunday. Oh, well, before we have Sunday school or anything, first, we better be getting a pastor. I get it. First, if you don't have a pastor, first thing you better be dealing with is having a pastor. But Paul says, first apostles. What? You're having church and you don't have an apostle? Mm-hmm. Wait a minute. First, before we, before we take up the offering, first, let's find an apostle. First, let's find a prophet. Oh, man, we don't want them prophets here. They cause trouble every time they come. Now, first, why why on earth do we want an apostle, a prophet, or a teacher? Because after that is miracles. Where's the miracles? I can tell you. Miracles will be found where it's first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. And if you don't have that in your church, you know where miracles will not be made manifest. Are you listening? Oh, I don't want to be title conscious. Well, Jesus called them apostles. So you're more spiritual than Jesus. 
because you're not title conscious. We need to change our thinking about these things, brother and sister. My brother, my sister, I realize you don't have to listen to me. You might not have made it to this end of this broadcast, but stop and think about it. What comes after apostles, prophets, and teachers? Miracles, healings, help, government. People are clamoring for miracles, but rejecting the things that must come before miracles. If your church or group rejects apostles and prophets, then they're rejecting miracles. Oh, we believe in miracles. No, you don't. Don't tell me your church believes in miracles and you reject apostles and you reject the prophets. If you have a church that systemically does not accept the prophets and the apostles in their midst, then you have a church that functionally rejects miracles, rejects healing, and that's why nobody's getting miracles and nobody's getting healed in your church. You need to stop and think about that. And I realize that you don't have to listen to Russ Walden but stop and think whether or not that is not plainly what this chapter is telling us. We need to give some thought. Paul concludes the chapter with the fact that while all may move in the gifts, it's interesting, he says you may all prophesy, but you're not all apostles and you're not all prophets. There's a lot of people promoting themselves to be apostles. There's a lot of people promoting themselves to be prophets. I got news for you. Not everybody is an apostle. Not everybody is a prophet, and God knows not everybody is a teacher. Somebody's got a bright idea, and they think they're a teacher. And all you have to do is take and see what the Word of God is saying, and and you know they're not a teacher when they sit there and talk for an hour and don't quote one scripture. Are you listening? That's not a teacher. They may think they're a teacher, but they're not the kind of teacher Paul's talking about. God wants us to have all that he has for us. He wants you to have help. I love that. Helps. How many need a little help? <laughs> then you better get in something that is first apostle, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. Then you're going to get a little help. God, God, help me, God. Okay, I sent you apostles. I sent you prophets. I sent you teachers. Oh, well, my church doesn't, doesn't have that. My pastor's not cooperating with that. Oh, well, you, I, I sent the help. You rejected it. You'd rather have your pastor that doesn't want apostles, prophets, and teachers. And no miracles and no help. Okay, well, you made your choice. I love you. Gave you my word. You can do it my way. You can do it your way. But if we do it God's way, we cannot ask God to do something contrary to his own word. And I realize it's not convenient, pastor. I've been a pastor for 25 years. I was a pastor. I was a pastor of pastors. I was responsible for 900 pastors. I know the mess that prophets make. I know the mess that apostles make. I've cleaned up after them for decades. I still love them. Uh, just like I love my kids. My kids made a mess when they were little. <laughs> and I didn't get rid of them because they made a mess. Because ultimately, the gifts of God come to us when we do things God's way. So, Father, we thank you for healthy body members, and they are, we are the body members that help and heal each other, that we are bringing our supply, every joint supplying, to make a whole uh, stronger, much stronger body. We thank you that the, we are lively stones, we're living, we're not dead, but we're walking about wanting and desiring to strengthen the body of Christ by being a healthy member ourselves, and we praise you and thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.